And Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Hymn 423. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be the kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together. Holy Spirit of light and love, to you I consecrate my heart, mind, and will for all time and eternity. May my heart be ever inflamed with the love of God and love of neighbor. May my will be ever in harmony with your divine will. May my life faithfully imitate the life and virtues of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him with the Father and you, O Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. reading from the wisdom of Solomon. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living, for he created all things so that they might exist. The generative forces of the world are wholesome, and there is no destructive poison in them, and the dominion of Hades is not on earth, for righteousness is immortal. God created us for incorruption and made us in the image of his own eternity. 
but through the devil's envy, death entered the world and those who belong to his company experience it. The word of the Lord. We'll read together from Lamentations today in unison. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 15. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you. So we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this manner, I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year, not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jarius came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him continually, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that the power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched my clothes? Jesus looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, but believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, whom? Which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that was a long gospel. It was one of those gospels that we get now and then where you have like multiple stories going along there. It's an interruption gospel. You know, you had something happening and then it gets interrupted and something else happens and then you come back and something else happens and then hopefully it gets back around to the beginning again, sometimes not really directly or at least obviously. If you know the, the, the lessons at all, if you're going to church, if you read your Bible, you probably know this lesson. I mean, it's a pretty well well-circulated lesson or a well-circulated bit of scripture. And I, I want to I point out some of the lessons in this passage of the gospel. Now, I'm going to just articulate a few of them, and they're not all of them. You may hear one that you picked up on, and you may not hear one, and that's great because there are a lot. I'm just going to go through a few of them I think are pertinent for us today because there is a, another lesson that is kind of hidden. And even though all of these lessons in here are evident in, in some way to us, the hidden one may be the most important one of all. Okay, so it starts off with Jesus, right? He's crossed over. He went over across the boat. He got on the boat, went across the lake, and he went, this was stuff over there. And now he's come back. And the people that were here when he left are still here waiting for him to come back because he can't stay over there. He's got to come back. This is where he's, he's doing his teaching. So they're waiting and he comes back and this big crowd greets him when he gets on to the land and he starts doing something. So one of the first lessons that we have in this lesson is that he immediately begins to teach. He begins to talk to the crowd. 
And what is he teaching? He's not saying, well, look at my robes. I'm, really, I'm snazzy today. Look how great I am. He is talking about the, the love of God, the love of the Father, the recognition of God. And for the people of God, for the Hebrews, for the chosen people, he's talking about the scripture. Remember when we say in the Nicene Creed that he came in fulfillment of the scripture, that is not the New Testament. The Nicene Creed is referring to the Old Testament, that the fulfillment of the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. So when Jesus is talking to the crowd, he is talking about the fulfillment or what is going to be the fulfillment of those prophecies in him. In the same way that when he walked on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection with the disciples, he spoke to them what? Not directly about himself, like saying, hey guys, I'm Jesus, remember me? He opened to them the scripture. He talked about the Old Testament. And when he left them, when their eyes were opened, they said, did our hearts not burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? That's the Old Testament. So Jesus is here teaching the crowd, and he's teaching them about the presence of God, the love of God, the purpose of God, the companionship of God, now known to us as the Father, as through Jesus' teaching, to them and with them through all eternity. And that presence is exampled by the continual litany of prophets and teachers and the companions along the way, all witnessing to that same God. So we have this first lesson of Jesus coming and teaching, not, not saying I am a great guy, but rather God is a great God, all right? And as he's teaching this, in the middle of his teaching and meeting of this crowd, because he could have gone anywhere, right? He's on the boat, here he comes to shore. Oh, dang, lots of people. He could have turned right and gone over there and, and, and emptied the boat on a, on a place where there wasn't anybody, but he didn't do that. He went to where the people were. And in the middle of this crowd comes Jarius, the leader of the temple. And he says, my, my falls on the ground and says, I have faith in you. My daughter is at the point of death. Can you come and help my daughter? Didn't, didn't bat an eye. He said, okay, I'm coming. So the second lesson is that Jesus' ministry is personal. It's not objective. It's not like, you know, Jesus over here yelling at you. Hey, Lee, got a message. Oh, stay there, please. Jesus is right on top of it. He wants to come. He wants to be a part of the life that we live, the life that you live, the life that Jarius has, the life of his daughter. He's a part of the, of the, of the plea that, Jesus, that Jarius has for him to help save his family. And he doesn't hesitate. He goes, boom, so he goes. Now, as he goes, he's trailing the crowd. They're all coming along with him. And they're all, it's a mixture in this crowd, right? It's a mixture. When I was young, I went to the Cap Games, the, the Capitol hockey team in Washington, D.C. And, and the Cap Games, I was guilty of this too. And I have to say, I did this to find out why people do this. And when it didn't do anything, I didn't do it anymore. Because I'm like, why do people do that? You ever see a ball game where, where there's the tunnel, you know, where the, like the football team comes out of the tunnel, and people are like hanging over the wall trying to touch the people when they go by? So I did that, you know. The hockey team was coming out and I got near the edge so I could touch the hockey guy, you know, the famous hockey guy. And I touched him and I'm like, what was that? And that didn't give me anything. So what? I touched the hockey guy. Big deal. People get all worked up about touching the football player or the NASCAR driver or the, the star, the TV star, right? I touched him. I'm, I remember those stories when the, the Beatles in the 60s, I'm never going to wash my hand again. Right? <laughs> That's kind of gross. There's something in it. And so people were there for two reasons. They were to touch Jesus because they didn't believe in him. They touched Jesus so they could go back to their friends and their family and say, I'm never going to wash my hands again. In other words, I'm the famous one. I touched him. Look at my hand. Right? I've done this too. You've done this too. I met John Wayne when I was a kid. Right? So I can say this. I met John Wayne. So it's kind of special. I just show that story because it's special to me to show the story, but I'm not famous because I, I, I saw John Wayne. But this crowd, there are people that just wanted to be there because they wanted to suck up on the I touched him, I knew him. There were other people there, like this woman, who really wanted healing, who really wanted to be made whole, who really wanted to have the presence of God manifest in their heart and mind and spirit, maybe physical wholeness, spiritual wholeness, mental wholeness. And that power of Jesus to make those people whole was going out of him all the time people receiving the blessing of Christ as he walked. This woman wasn't the only one. She was one of the ones. So the next lesson is that Jesus does not withhold his mercy, his grace, and his blessing from the people. He doesn't do that. He didn't say, oh, you, you people aren't doing this for the right reason. You go away. You people are. 
He let anybody come in the hope that whoever came would be manifest, would ch be changed by the manifestation in the presence of God. Okay, so this woman touches him and he stops and he says, who touched me? And his disciples have that response, wouldn't you? Like all these people are touching and they say, how can you say who's touching? Look at all these people that are touching. They're all touching. And Jesus turned, doesn't pay any attention to them, turns around and he says, now why would he do that? He knew who touched him. Of course he knew everybody. He knew everybody there that was touching him. He did that because his interaction personally with this woman had a twofold purpose. One was the healing, which had already taken place. No harm, no foul, didn't have to do a thing. Two, it was now empowering her to continue the progression of her life in Christ and become more. Actually an evangelist in this moment, a witness to the life of Christ, to the love of God, to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so he didn't have to say, Jenny, did you touch me? He didn't have to do that. He just had to say it. Now she knew in herself what had happened. It says it right here. She didn't need any more than that. She came to him in the same way that when we are in the presence of what is awesome, especially if it's God, I don't know about you, but I have multiple times in my life been driven to my knees because I've recognized the presence of God in my life. And I know exactly who that is. And maybe I'm a bold man, but I'm not bold enough to stand up in front of God and go, hi. My response is to get on my knees and, and, and supplicate to say, thank you. I'm just a little tiny thing and important as the cosmos to God, but still it's God. So she came and fell at his feet and she said, it's me. And he, he's like, of course it's you. Stand up. Your faith has made you whole. You're healed. Go. This was for the witness to everybody else. So the next lesson is that Jesus has empowered this woman through what has already taken place in her life to become, to continue to become more than she is. There is no standing still in the faith. There is no standing still in the growth in our understanding of our life in Jesus Christ. It, it isn't. It's either moving forward or moving backwards, because if we're not moving forward, life is certainly continuing. We are losing ground. We are losing. I, I sat, stood, and knelt at the bedside of a lot of people in Washington Hospital Center when I was the chaplain there who had lost most of their life ground. And at this moment, we're just asking to be forgiven because they were unfulfilled. We don't stand still in our faith. We either lose ground or we gain ground. Right? So he has given this woman the chance and now the, the commission to, to gain ground, to keep going, to become this witness, not of herself, but of him, which is where she started and where she's going to continue. Now, now, it's, it's an interruption, right? This is like some weird thing that just happened. Jesus is going to save the girl, and he's in the middle of saving the girl, and boom, this whole other story pops up and takes this time and stuff like this. But he doesn't lose track. He keeps on going. It's an interruption. It's a sideline. He's got, it's got to stop. He's got to deal with it. But he deals with it because that's what God does, and he's all in with this woman. He's not treating her less than he treated Jarius. He's 100% with her, and after this, he turns and he keeps going to the house. And when he gets to the house, well, they, get, they have that message, the kid's dead, right? But he says, oh, no, no, I'm still going, still going, because they don't understand what that means. They think it means one thing. He knows it means something else. Of course, for us, we know that the death of this body on earth is not the death of who we are. This is, I love this old phrase, right? Jesus turned death from a period into a comma. It's the middle of a sentence. My life is going to continue. Our family's life that has gone beyond us, they are doing just fine. They are, in fact, better than we are celebrating because they're, if they're Christians, they are before the throne of God celebrating and being celebrated by God. We miss them. I miss them. I miss my mother. I miss the time I spent. I miss her face. I miss talking to her. I miss hearing her voice. But I know that she is doing just fine. So I grieve that. Anybody have friends that live in a different city, different state, that are far away? You haven't seen them in five years or 10 years, right? You miss them, but they're just fine. They're doing great. These are the triumphants that have gone on before us. Right? These people are doing just fine. I miss them. They live in Wisconsin. They're someplace else. But they are still there. So Jesus wants this to be known to the people, that God gives life. 
life that we do not understand, life in this world and life in the, in the heavenly country, life beyond. So he says to the people, why are you wailing and crying? And they say, she's dead. And he says, no, she's sleeping. And what did they do? They laughed at him. What a wild thing to find in scripture. They laughed at him. So he puts them out of the house, says, you don't get it. You don't understand. This is the way you're going to come at it because you're coming at it, people of faith. Remember, these are the chosen people. Well, they're the people who should have been the chosen people. They're the people who don't recognize that this is God. And so he puts them out of the house and says, this is not for you. This is not for you. You're not going to get this. You are looking at this strictly from this world perspective. You cannot see me because you're not looking to God with your eye of your heart and your spirit. Not like Jarius who came to me in the beginning and the woman who came to me in the middle, that interruption. And so he goes up with Peter, James, and John. He goes up with the mother and the father and he says to the little girl, Talitha, come, get up. And she gets up and she starts to walk around. She's 12 years old. It's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? She's 12 years old. There's that number 12 that comes back again. Not going to spend too much time on that. But again, what we have is we have this personal interaction that is part of this particular gospel story. Jesus' interaction personally with this, with this young person. And it's not a belabored interaction, is it? He doesn't tell her, okay, I've raised you from the dead. Now here's the 47 things you're going to have to do in the next seven years to prove that you're worthy of being raised from the dead. It doesn't do any of that. He just says, get up, get up, you're fine. And this, this next little bit is, uh, immediately the girl began to work, and they were overcome with amazement. So even out of faith, Jarius came and said, you can save my daughter from dying. The girl has died. Now Jesus raises her from the dead, and he's amazed. So his faith has not flowered yet. He does not see him completely as the Son of God, as the Messiah. But in this moment, maybe yes. Maybe in the next few moments, maybe yes. This is the completion of his faith journey. And he says to them now this strange thing. People get hung up on this. He says, don't tell anybody. Why would he say that? Because people are coming to touch him and say, I'm not going to wash my hands ever again. People are coming to see Jesus the reason, the same way they came to see John the Baptist. They want to be able to say, I saw the superstar. So Jesus says, don't tell them this because I don't want them to come to me because they think I'm going to do a magic trick. They need to come to me because they know me in their heart or they're seeking me in their spirit. And then they will be fulfilled. If they come to me looking for a magic trick, they will leave with a magic trick. That's it. So don't share this. And then what does he say? How does he finish this up? Give her something to eat. Get her a bologna sandwich. So what is that lesson? That lesson tells us that this is normal. It's time for lunch. Raised from the dead, time for lunch. Raised from the dead, get some bologna. They didn't, there's no special thing going on here. The girl is now not a superstar. She is now not holy in some way where she doesn't have to eat anymore. She's going to be put on a pedestal and you're going to come and gaze at her for hours and days and they're going to build a shrine around her. That's not it at all. She's a 12-year-old girl. She's going to walk around her room and say, hey, my plant needs watering. And then mom and dad are going to get her a sandwich. So the lesson here is that this is a regular part of our life. We think it's extraordinary. Raised from the dead? How is that ordinary? Because that's the promise of God. Maybe you and I don't think we're going to be raised from the dead. Like, I'm going to keel over dead right here and then pop back up and go, wow. But we are going to be raised from the dead. If it's not in this earthly body, it is in the very next moment of my eternal existence. I'm going to drop dead in my body here and be raised in my spirit there, and my life will continue just like that without missing a beat. And this is the lesson that Jesus is giving. This is a normal thing now, not the desired thing now, but the normal thing now with the intervention of God in Christ, raising the dead, saving those who were lost, bringing back those who are faithful in the midst of this interruption. Hmm. And there's the overlooked lesson and perhaps the most important one, the interruption. Jesus is on the way to do one thing, interrupted by another. Going to do something else, interrupted by something else. Going to go and get that done, interrupted by those people. Interruptions. It is a regular part of your life and my life, isn't it? Interruptions. All that You were interrupted this morning probably half a dozen times you don't even realize it. The little tiny interruptions in our life and the flow of our life are so common to us, we just we swoop, swoop right by them. The big interruptions are the ones that get our attention. You know, I'm on the way to an important meeting or a doctor's office or something, and I look down and realize I have to get gas. 
the flow of the whole morning, the whole day, all my plans are just shot. I have to go get gasoline, I have to find a gas station. I can't go to the post office because I'm using up all my time. I go to get my phone, my battery's dead. I was gonna make that call, that special foot and call, I can't do it now. These big interruptions are the ones that we remember, but the little ones, where are my keys? Oh, they're there. It's an interruption. I wanted to grab my keys and go, oh, here I go. The flow of things, but I, I couldn't do that because I, I absentmindedly put them over here last time. How do we live in the midst of the interruption is the greatest lesson or one of the, maybe the, maybe the greatest, or perhaps one of the greatest lessons of this. And we find this example to us exactly in the wisdom of Solomon. That is what is happening in this lesson, in the first lesson. He said, God did not make death, for it is not delight in the death of the living, for he created all things that they may exist for the genitive fortresses. He's going on to say, life in me was designed from the very beginning. This is God. Life in me was designed from the beginning not to be interrupted by death, not to be interrupted by other things of your mind, of your thought, of sin, of distraction. This is not what I, what I plan for. The process of life, though, is still in you. It's mine, and I've given it to you. It is now the communion of you and me to keep these interruptions to a minimum. You're not going to overcome them. I literally did not remember putting my keys right there. So I'm interrupted by my own absent-mindedness. Now the next step is, what do I do with the interruption? Do I live into it? I have a person I know very well, not in this parish, who lives into their whole life is, a, is, is dedicated to interruptions. They live for them. It's like a crisis life. Everything that happens in their life that is not what they plan. I wanted to go here and I couldn't go there. Oh my gosh, they spend the next 30 minutes talking to them in line about the thing that stopped them from going to the place where they were going to go. The more important thing than going to the place was the little interruption that stopped them for five minutes. They live into these places. And if, if you know anyone like this, what you find is that oftentimes the, the spirit is not happy. It's stunted and punctuated. So how about this new one? I can't find my keys, but oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I found my keys now. Now on my way to my car, I thank God and I say a little prayer because I'm 30 seconds late. Now I'm like, it's going to be okay. And so I start my prayers as I go. It's in that moment that I make a choice. How do I respond to the interruption of life? Do I live into the interruption? Or do I live into the fact that I'm in Money is power, and you better do whatever I don't want to do. 
That's what that is. So I will go to any lengths I can, this is what the world tells us, right? To keep my money. Even sometimes it means breaking the law. I get to keep my money. So now let's look at Christian. Now let's look at Paul and he talks about this. He says, you, you know who God is, if you think you do, you have been inspired by God. Oh, now you've gone to church, found God, recognize who Jesus Christ is, right? That's the resurrection. Now it's time to do something about it. You can't just you remember sitting quietly? You can't. This is not easy. I do this a lot. It's just fun. But you know, years ago, the church said to the Orthodox or the Catholic Church, and the Anglican Church has had this as for the whole time hermits can no longer hermitize. If you're a hermit, you can go live in a cave on the church's dime, right? No problem. You can live in a cave for three months. After three months, you have to come back and live in a monastery for a month. Because if you're living there listening quietly, sitting quietly, listening to God, then you actually you start to hurt something by that. You need to come back and you need to tell us what you've learned. You have to put into action what is growing in your heart and your mind and your spirit. You can't just keep it to yourself. You can't just sit. That's why the next line is, you must want to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. The Christian who's living in a vacuum is not going to meet the smiter, the person who says, oh, you're an idiot for believing in Jesus Christ. He's saying you have to go out and confront the world. You have to. Evangelism, the witness, is part of who we are growing in Jesus Christ. There's no choice. There's a no vacuum in our Christian walk. You're either moving forward or you're moving back. There's another guy. I'm just going to name him. Scott Bezos. We've been talking about him in our house a lot. Did you hear about do you know he is the richest man in the world, right? Trillionaire, right? Do you know how much he makes every year, his salary? Take a guess. Come on, take a guess. Million dollars? $88,000. That's all he makes. That's why he doesn't pay any taxes. Of course, he's not breaking the law like that other person, or supposedly like the other person. He worked this out from the beginning. He's so smart. From the moment he got Amazon going, he said, I'm the CEO. The salary of the CEO is $88,000 unchanged. That's it. He makes $88,000 a year. So he doesn't pay taxes because he gives away more than he gets. But what he did was he got stock options forever and ever and ever. So his millions and trillions of dollars are all in stock options. So he can go to say, I want a $100 million yacht. He goes to the bank and says, I want $100 million for my yacht. And they go, oh, sure, good. Because they know the guy's worth billions and billions of dollars, and they know that the interest coming from his stock and yeah, is going to pay it off, but he's not paying. Why would he do that? Money is power, just, just like everybody else that's trying to keep it. Money is power. For the Christian, I don't hear about a lot of these people saying, I've got a trillion dollars, just I got a billion dollars just lying around. Look at that. Oh my gosh, so there on the floor. I think I'm going to rebuild an entire school district. I think I'm going to help out all these people in need. I think I'm going to create a whole new science project to solve the, uh, the cancer. I don't, all of these things he could be doing. When Paul's talking about equalizing, about doing something, he's not saying go broke, give away all your money to somebody else and let them whack their way off. The thing. He's saying there is a proportionality to the reality of our life in Jesus Christ, that we cannot simply see this problem over here and have all of this and not do anything sit down and be silent. That the completion of our life and work in Christ, our completion of our love in Christ, is the doing of things, is getting out and doing it, taking the interruptions as part of the gift of life, not of the curse of life, because we turn them around to an opportunity to praise and to love God. The one who has too much does not have too much, and the one who has too little does not have too little. Oh my gosh, these people have too much. Does anybody, does anybody here say that these people don't have too much? And yet some of them propose, propose to be Christians. I'm a Christian. I don't give anything to anybody, but I'm a Christian. These are the ones that are grabbing a hold of his robe when he walks by, saying, I touched him. There are always going to be people like that. That's not the teaching. That's not who we are.
Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is but sleeping. Faith, faith is the eyes of love and joy and wonder, felicity, communion, fellowship with God. The eyes of faith show us that she's just sleeping. The eyes of faith bring our hearts and minds closer to the throne of God and give us the strength we need to give of our love, of our smile, of our kindness, of our hearing, of our action, of our resources in the name of Jesus Christ to grow and to continue to grow in Christ's name. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. And therefore, I will hope in God. Amen. Please stand with me. The service continues on page 358 in your prayer book or page 6, I believe, in your bulletin. Let us say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. <clears throat> Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord Jesus, you sent the Holy Spirit to your apostles to empower them to lead your people in the first days of your church. Send that same spirit to us and empower us as we seek to serve you here and now. Lord Jesus, renew a right spirit in us. Holy Spirit, fill us with awe and wonder, love and compassion, holy joy and felicity as we grow together and seek to do the Father's will. Holy Spirit, fill us with loving reverence toward Jesus as we strive to be his witness in the world. Holy Father, draw us together into your heart and by the power of your love, enlighten our minds and hearts to know your peace. Holy Father, comfort us in your love that we may in all things and through all things know your presence with us. Gracious Holy Spirit, we claim the promises of Jesus and beseech you to hear our prayers and to pray through us. Gracious Holy Spirit, heal the sick, the lonely, protect the weak and the innocent, strengthen the searchers and give direction to all. O oh, Holy Spirit, Help us to trust and to know that even as we may not understand, we are loved and cared for. O oh, Holy Spirit, be made known to us in everything, everyone, all places, 
all times, that we may reflect the will of the Father and the love of the Son in everything we say and do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have brought us to this place and to this day. We pray especially for members of our parish family who are in need, who are alone, who are in distress, or who are sick. We ask for your healing hand to be upon them. We ask for your blessing and care for all who are in need, especially for those who are seeking after you. Help them to find you, not to be discouraged or be distracted. Enlighten the interruptions of their life and ours to show them and us the way closer to you and to deepen our love and our appreciation for your faith in us. Lord, this day we pray especially for Carolee Stuckey and for Steve, for the rest of her family as she grieves the death of her mother, Willie. We ask you to bless her and to bring her and her family peace and to fill her with peace and with consolation in the days and weeks to come. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life, the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Yeah. God's peace be with you. Please be seated. So I invite you to uh, stay on if you can after the service uh, is completed for announcements and just a few housekeeping things. Uh, if you'd like to, if you can't, then, then no harm, no foul. We'll see you, you guys, uh, you please could stay on as well and be happy to go over some things that are going on in the parish and have any questions and answers we can take care of right away. Uh, service is continuing, as we may have noticed in the, in the bulletin with the page numbers for our Book of Common Prayer, and they are inside the door when you come in. You can take a BCP and a hymnal with you when you come in and follow along in the BCP or continue to observe the service here. From time to time, we will, as we have today, have items in the, prayer, in the, in the bulletin that are not found in the Book of Common Prayer. This, unfortunately, is a reality of our life because when the 79 prayer book was made, it couldn't, they couldn't uh, and didn't put everything in it from the 1928 prayer book. And since then, there not only have been is a movement to recapture much of the beautiful lost liturgy of the 1928 prayer book, but there is much liturgy from other prayer books around the world, such as the Kenyan prayer book, which we used at Shrinemont, uh, that, would, that is absolutely wonderful for us to enjoy. So I hope you at home can have a bulletin that you can follow along in these places within the service, but if you do not, then please uh, follow along in the Book of Common Prayer, either the, your personal copy or your online copy, and the page numbers are listed here in the bulletin. So we will continue the service after, uh, after the offering, uh, beginning on page 361 with the Eucharistic service. Let your light so shine before all that they may see of your good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and lead them into all truth, uniting people of many tongues in the confession of one faith, and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 
Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.
Alleluia. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.